You're watching TVC Breakfast. Now, the adoption of indirect primaries by political parties that involve the delegate system have seen many lawmakers lose their party tickets. The 10th National Assembly might have the highest turnout of legislators as more than 200 of them were not returned to the hallowed chambers. Samo Mashe had a chat with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, on this, as well as the gale of defections. Let's watch this. Welcome to TVC Breakfast. Thank you. I want to say before we start, uh, uh, happy birthday to you. Uh, happy 60th. Well, thank you. Now that you've told the whole world how old I am. <laughs> Well, um, well, let us start with your legislative experience. It's been a, it's been a core. You know when you get on the, to the sixth, when you get to the sixth floor. Yes. <laughs> when you get to the sixth floor, you try to uh, keep it as quiet as possible. <laughs> it is uh, also interesting that um, you are now in your third year as a speaker of the House of Representatives and so on, what would you say uh, have been your experience, your, uh, your experience as, uh, as uh, the, the, the chief lawmaker in the House of Representatives and the uh, number fourth citizen, as they say, in the Federation? Um, what, has, what has been the experience like? What have been the challenges and what have you had to endure doing this job? Well, I mean, Again, that's very wide, but in three years, I've been the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and you've come to that realization, or you come to the right shoulder. Uh, uh, and that's tough, and that's very difficult, and it comes with challenges. And whilst you're trying to manage that, you also have to manage your primary constituency as well. Well, you don't even have a primary constituency anymore. Your primary constituency is Nigeria. Uh, but then you also have your colleagues who that you have to, um, you have to work with. Um, and uh, all of this come with their, their challenges as well. It's part of the challenge is that um, you have to be there 24 seven. It's not a nine to five job. Uh, be there uh, for everybody, for everybody. Uh, uh, the whole, the weight of the, uh, the weight of the country and the challenges of the country uh, on your shoulder. And it doesn't even matter whether it's your constitutional responsibility, you must have to solve the problems. It's a problem solving uh, job. And people don't care whether, uh, whether you're, you're responsible for this or for that. All they know is that you're the speaker. So you need to get the job done. You try to explain to even the, the, the most educated person that in, in a constitutional democracy, there's separation of powers. And um, uh, this is not my responsibility, and they don't want to hear that. So you have to be ready to take everything on board. And um, that's a very challenging job. And I say to people, it's the most, uh, being the speaker is the, uh, is the most difficult, uh, most, most challenging job in the world because you have the responsibilities that are enormous. Uh, apart from the whole world, you have 359 other members uh, that look up to you. Uh, deal with you know, uh, one problem or the other. And you must do that. And you must answer to their needs. You must answer to their, uh, answer their calls. And um, unlike, uh, and, and you're first among equals. They're, they're your contemporaries. They're not, uh, uh, even though they call you their boss, but you know deep down that you know, they're not, you're not their boss, they're, they're equal. And uh, it's unlike the why it's most difficult job in the world, unlike the, the governor, and I say this all the time, a governor, for instance, um, deals with subordinates. I don't. You know, he deals with the subordinates. He decides what he wants and, and what he doesn't want. He can decide he's not coming to work for the next three months. He can decide I'm going to go to Germany or go to London and sit down and control my state from wherever I am. And, and this is what's going to happen to him. Um, ditto any president. Um, just, just the way the, the, it, it's structured. Uh, but for the speaker, it's different. For the Senate president, it's different. But why the Senate Speaker's job is more important than the Senate President's job is that the Senate President deals with only roughly about 100 or 100 other members, whilst the Speaker deals with about 359 or almost 400 members. Um, so, uh, so, 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 so there you have it. That's for me. That's the most difficult and challenging job. But thank God, the Biden, you need, you need, you need wisdom. 
you need uh, capacity, and more important, you need the grace of God uh, to be able to discharge your responsibility. And thank God, so far, so good. Yes, um, recently you came, uh, I say, into the news because of um, your position on open primaries. And in a sense, what you said has become, um, uh, has taken currency because of uh, what happened in the primaries, especially that of the PDP, where they said money was being thrown around and so on and so forth. Um, why do you think, why do you think uh, the idea of open primaries will have even been better? Okay, well, let's be put it on record that um, everything I foresaw or that we did in the house and we, our worries and our fears played out. Played out. Even uh, our worst fears were confirmed during the primaries. Uh, and apart from the issue of money, which everybody was talking about, uh, and bribing delegates and buying votes and all of that, no. uh, beyond that, uh, uh, Let's talk about the, the process itself. Let me put it on record that indirect primaries is not in and of itself a bad thing. No. It's the process and how those delegates emerge. That's, therein lies the problem. How do you have delegates that are determined by two people? I can give you names of uh, sitting senators who are absolutely, extremely popular in there districts. I can give you names of honorable members who are totally popular, are extremely popular in their districts, but not a single delegate. Because the delegate is, you just sit down and you write people's names, um, maybe even people who have not even participated in politics. And you tell them, and then when the time comes for primaries, okay, you go vote for this person. And then one person determines, okay, you're not going back on uh, uh, my, my, my nephew is going to be the next uh, senator. Or I am going to the Senate, and so so things like that. Uh, it, it, it corrupts the system, and it, uh, it doesn't all go well for the institution. And these were my fears and my worries. If a member is not popular, I will never support him. In fact, it will be it will be on him, and it will be good for him if he's if, if, if he's if he's rejected by his constituents. But where a member has done so much for his constituents and his constituency, and the evidence is there. And then at the end of four years, you tell him, okay, I'm not interested, I don't like your face, all right, uh, these are the delegates that are going to vote. At the end of the day, you don't even encourage legislators. What you're doing is you're sending a subliminal message to whoever is coming in that, oh, my goodness, this guy did so well, but look what happened to him at the end of four years. So what's he going to do, the, the incoming guy for the next four years? He knows that he's not going to be returned based on merit. So he's just basically going to come to the National Assembly and do whatever uh, he wants, knowing full well that all he has to do is be on the good book, in the good books of his governor or his chairman or whoever uh, the power of the player is in, in his constituency. And that's not what we want in, the, in, in a democracy. And open primaries for me, people said, oh, no, no, open primaries or direct primaries uh, is just as uh, bad or they can be manipulated. Okay, so let's go for the lesser of two evils then, if that be the case. How many people do you want to do? First of all, the, the definition of democracy itself, you are allowing every party member to, to vote, as opposed to indirect primaries, where six people can end up voting for a representative. 40 people can end up voting for a senator for a whole district based on the, 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 the delegate system. But as, as opposed to the direct primaries, where every single person, member of the party, determines. And that's what democracy is all about. When you talk about democracy, for, uh, government of the people, for the people, by the people, it's not about general elections. It starts from the primaries. So members of the party vote for who they want to represent them. You, are, you become more accountable to your constituents, not accountable to two, three individuals. Because therein lies the difference. And at the end of the day, uh, you say, how many people, if you're talking about money, monetization of the of, 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 of votes, how many people in the, in the party do you want to bribe? That's why the delegate system, the index is even more expensive because it's impossible to, for anybody, even if you have the state treasury, to, 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 bribe, uh, to bribe members members of the party. So I, I, all in all, I, I hope that we have learned our lessons and that um, um, 
we will look at the direct primary system. And if we don't, if we, if we insist on the indirect primary system, how those delegates are produced by open contest will be the way, will be the way to go. Um, it's regrettable um, when you keep turning, turning in uh, around, around legislators. There's a reason why the spread of the constitution says uh, legislators, apart from governors, it gives you two terms. President gives you two terms. For some reason, all over the world. We asked ourselves, why do they say, no, no, legislators are not bound by it terms. They are supposed to, uh, they can come back as uh, many times as they want, are, are subject to the approval of their constituents. But every day we try to, 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 to compare Nigerian legislators to uh, American legislators or legislators from, uh, from, from other advanced democracies. But we forget, we, don't, we want to compare Nigerians, but we don't want to do what they do where you have legislators who've been there for 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, who understand the nuances of the business, who understand the system, um, who are enriched with knowledge. So how do you compare the two when you turn legislators for by turn by turn? Okay, it's my senatorial district today, or it's my uh, ward to the uh, next four years. No, it doesn't work that way. You can't, you, can, you, you can't want us or want legislators to be like legislators in advance, but you don't want to do what they do in advance. Yeah. You can pick or choose what, and choose what you want and what you don't want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question. That brings me directly to the next question, which is about the Electoral Act. That, that in spite of all that uh, you have spoken about and uh, all that we experienced, um, what the legislators are asking for is is going back to the electoral act not to talk about open primaries but to talk about statutory delegates mm -hmm. well let's put it this way again statutory delegates are not foreign to democracy they're not foreign they're anywhere in the world i mean in america I mean, a, they call them super delegates uh, you know uh, but what and then you ask yourself what is the reason Let, let's put it this way you have a president uh, Parties conducted their primaries, and you're going to end up having a president elect, which from their primaries was elected by 800 delegates. President of a uh, president uh, by 800 delegates, but in the case of APC, by 2,000 or, or so delegates, for a country of 250 million people. A country of 250 million people, where is the, where is the representation there? Um, but, but for me, statutory delegates. I think there was a misunderstanding, and the National Assembly has received a lot of knocks when it comes to this issue of statutory delegates. Statutory delegates have been in the books forever. It's been really good. It was in eight, it was in the 2010 electoral law, and we've always that same language that we tried to amend was the language in the previous electoral law where statutory delegates voted by law. What the National Assembly tried to do, and I need to explain this. Is to make the law better and clearer. You, as, your, as, a, as, a, as a legislator, your responsibility is to make sure if there's a, uh, there's a possibility of misinterpretation or, 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 or making a, a provision of a law even clearer and remove any ambiguity, the law frowns at ambiguities. And we looked at it and we thought, you know what? This was in the 2010. Uh, Electoral Act and it allows statutory delegates, even though it didn't mention statutory delegates. Someone could go thought I'd be mischievous and say, okay, so since you did not mention statutory delegates, um, um, you cannot vote. We we're just trying to make assurances double short for the sake of democracy. So we brought it back and said, okay, you know what? For emphasis, just add statutory delegates. Unfortunately, well, some people cashed in on that and said, okay, oh, no, 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 no. That means that statutory delegates were never to vote in the first place. But that's not the case. And we had, a, we had a, the courts decided just about a few days before the primaries. And no, 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 no. This was part of the 2010. So even though the president has not signed, statutory delegates can still vote. But by that time, it was a little bit too, too late because we we're already, the primaries have come upon us. Um, so as it is today, even without the signature of the president, statutory delegates are allowed to vote. And the, the reason. Are not, are not, are not, are not, are not, it helps the system. Uh, people should be a little bit more 
forget how you feel about the National Assembly or whatever, but and let's look at the bigger picture. Um, do you want um, 2,000 people voting for your, for your, for your president? 2,000 people voting for your president. Hmm. Now, speaking about that, we, 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 there's a story going on now uh, about the National Assembly and the rash of defections going on in the National Assembly, in the Senate, the House of Rep, and so on. This, this is causing some ripples. And I know uh, as a legislator, you have a way at the end of every session, there, uh, all of you all of you who came in, not all of you will come the next time. You welcome new people. Um, at the at the at the other session, like the next session that you are going to next, you are likely to welcome new people. But there's a sense that uh, this time is is really significant. Why is that? Well, you're talking about the defection, the spate of defection. Yeah, defection. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it's 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 clear. I mean, I, I mean, for every uh, very every thesis and um, antithesis, there's a synthesis. You know, for every uh, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I can assure you that if members had a fair shake, if they went to elections and they lost squarely, nobody would be defected. They would know because they fell on their own sword. But where in a situation where, where you know you've been robbed, so to speak, or your constituents have been robbed, a lot of this, some of these defections are able based on the constituents themselves. They say, no, this is not our choice. You are our choice. We will go with you to another party. Our members want to go and trust their metal or their strength. You know, about popularity. And I, 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 so, so be it. Um, there's something about uh, see, equity, fairness, justice. Those are three very, very, very strong words that, that carry a serious import. You, 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 you cannot uh, um, sit down and basically. Um, uh, um, ask somebody, terminate somebody's um, um, career, job, or whatever it is, or even the constituent's um, uh, uh, um, choice, and expect them the, the person to just roll over and die or go away. Um, uh, people, uh, for me, just it just doesn't it just doesn't it just doesn't work that way. And if members had a good uh, affair. A fair deal, a fair shake. Um, they will remain in their party, even though they've um, they've, they've lost uh, the the elections. Um, so I think it's a it's it's a lesson. I think uh, the party, both parties, you know, and it's all parties across board. Uh, once there is no fairness, once there is no equity, um, this is the result, and it's not even good for the system. It's not good for the institution. The the, the legislative arm is not a it's not a it's not a, you, you can't liken it to a barber's chair or, or, or a revolving door where people just go around and around and around every four years. Uh, what Nigerians don't understand is that they are the ones that will be holding the short end of the stick. Yeah, it has been said that uh, some of these lawmakers who are now complaining and defecting, they were also imposed in their own time against other people. And uh, so why are they complaining now when they are trying to replace them? Because they replaced other people by position. Now they are not being replaced by position, they are crying. Well, I guess, um, look, look, there's a there's a, there's a a saying that goes that um, um, uh, self-preservation is the first instinct of any human being, All right? Um, uh, so if they, if they are getting the, uh, their just dessert, because they were imposed, and that, 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 that's assuming that they were imposed. I don't know of anybody that was imposed, but let's even go with that argument. If, they, if, if you're saying that they were imposed, and therefore they should just keep quiet about they were because they are imposed on, on them, and they get their own just desire. The question is, what, how does that help the system? Um, we're talking about law of retribution. That's, uh, that's, that's old school. For me, for me, uh, do you want to maintain or keep something that is wrong in perpetuity? No. As progressives, we need to change that system. We can't say because this happened today, it must continue like that. You know, we, we can't we can't continue to do that. 
does that the, 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 the rule against perpetuity even in law? So I, 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 I don't think I don't subscribe to that. Now let us look at uh, one of the, the the things that you have brought in as a speaker. This idea of coalition uh, um, speakers and uh, creating, as it were, a kind of super super parliament for the continent. Um, how has that gone? Well, it's gone very well. Well, well I, I, I sat down and I felt um, um, uh, uh, as African speakers, we must have our own agenda for the continent. Uh, we must, uh, our problems, our shared problems are almost uniform. Um, in terms of health, in terms of poverty, in terms of security. Um, so we may as well to speak with one voice. And so I got other speakers around the continent uh, to buy into the idea. And they felt, they felt it was a long time coming. And, um, and, um, and um, uh, all happy to, to join hands and speak with one voice. Uh, the first thing we put on was the issue of debt cancellation uh, as opposed to that um, uh, review, uh, we felt you know we had to press the reset button and cancel African debt and let's start all over again because debt review is just basically kicking the can down the road. You're just going to pick up that debt, and uh, we could, uh, money saved from debt cancellation can be used and applied to other areas. Otherwise, you live in bondage, perpetual bondage. Um, to the, and so we're still pursuing that, and um, that is common amongst all African countries. Uh, and then um, we'll pick on other areas, health, and the rest of it as one issue uh, uh, per time. So we had our first um, physical meeting, not inaugural meeting, but we meeting via Zoom because of COVID. But we had our first uh, physical meeting uh, here in Nigeria um, a little over a couple of months ago. Um, that went very well, it was very successful. We had about 23 thereabouts uh, uh, speakers from African parliaments. It's called Conference of Speakers uh, African Parliaments, COSA. That's what it is. And that's uh, where well, we were meeting again in Canada in August, uh, and a sidebar meeting at the, uh, the CPA meeting. Uh, we're holding a sidebar meeting of COSA up there where issues again will be brushed out. So yes, it was innovative, it was different, it was innovative, but it was welcome. Uh, do, you think that, do you think that this idea could really work to cancel our debts? Uh, our debts co co uh, compared to, to, to the economies of, of the Western world is, uh, is actually nothing. But, but do you think they will even come down to really uh, Cut out to this very good idea of trying, trying to cancel our debts. And what do you think are the um, impediments? Well, first of all, I, I, I think anything good is worth trying. It will not be for want of trying. So uh, we will try first. We will advance the, the arguments. We will advance the need for all of us to, for them to release that, that uh, choke. Uh, the knee of our necks, uh, as, 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 as was said uh, in America. Um, and, and if we can get that done, uh, if we can see um, the, the benefits, don't forget that the Western world also needs some benefits. They can see the benefits in them to releasing us of this uh, uh, financial slavery. And then I believe it's a win, it's a win win situation. They will be more than happy to happy to. We we, we all signed and undertake here that we will uh, whatever money is uh, uh, released from debt cancellation. We'll sit down around table with our creditors and prioritize areas of spending. And the speakers have signed and undertake it. that they will be absolutely involved in monitoring uh, the the ex those those expenditures. So we 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 will sit down on the table with our creditors. Uh, uh, debt forgiveness, debt forgiveness uh, isn't entirely a bad thing. We can be properly, uh, be properly, properly uh, uh, utilized. That's uh, the, the, the money that come that flow there from, uh, from, uh, from utilized. And uh, then we're onto something good.
But I can assure you that that uh, otherwise all African countries are in the same boat. Uh, you're paying off your budget yearly. You're paying off. Uh, you're paying off. You're paying off um, uh, creditors. But at the same time, you have to develop as a, as a, as, a, as a country. So you need those creditors to assist you to uh, to to give you loans for you to develop your country. Yeah, there's no country in the world, even the most advanced, even America, they collect loans every day. But the question is, are you able to pay off those loans? And if you're not able to pay off loans, and you've gone to a point because of COVID and the rest of it, uh, happenstances, the things that you never thought of, well, you can apply for debt forgiveness. And that's what we're doing. Um, you have um, been uh, um, interacting with uh, a lot of uh, the lawmakers from a Across the continent, and uh, especially the speakers, how do you think? Uh, what have you learned on your on your own personal level about the continent from from that point of view? I, I, there's a lot of pride amongst um, Africans that they're Africans. There's a pride in in in, in who they are, what they represent, uh, their culture. You know, we're rich in different countries, we're rich in, uh, in heritage and culture. And, and you see that when we interact, when we have conferences and, and symposiums and workshops. Uh, that, that is the first thing, and uh, that point of unity is the first thing that uh, you see. And um, our problems, like I said earlier, our challenges are the same, mostly. Uh, from Rwanda to Kenya to Ghana to Nigeria to, uh, to Sierra Leone to to Liberia, to, to just name it, we all identify the same problem, mostly, uh, irrespective of the language we speak. Um, so we call this together with that because of our common problems, and we're looking for challenge uh, for, 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 for ways to deal with uh, those problems. And so I, I have learned a lot. And outside of legislative work, outside of legislative work, you also learn a lot about different cultures in the same. Uh, uh, continent. Uh, you learn about history. You learn about um, uh, so many things. Uh, Rwanda. I'm sure uh, uh, if you haven't visited. It's a point of uh, place of visit. It should be a place of visit for you. And uh, you learn about their history and what they went through, the genocide and the rest. You know how they've come out of it. Uh, how they've come out of it. And and when you hear that, or you listen to that, or you see that. You, you, you realize that this is an African country. And so you hold on to it. You, 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 you borrow a leaf from their own experiences and apply it where, wherever it's applicable in your own country. So those, those, those are the benefits. All right, the, the, the last question to round off. Uh, um, the cultural differences in all of them, you must have uh, noticed some. Which ones, which ones uh, um, really stand out, and um, what do you want to achieve in the in the in the in the last uh, year of uh, this your stewardship? What do you look forward to? Cultural differences. I I did. I'll pen that on paper one of these days, and uh, and um, and um, and uh, try and come out with what the difference between Nigeria and Rwanda is, or Nigeria and uh, South Africa. Uh, Nigeria and Ghana, apart from the uh, uh, rivalry in football and, 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 and whose rice is better, uh, if you want to call that cultural sorts. Uh, but yeah, yes, whose jollof rice is better. We, we, we banter about that every time we meet. Um, but on a serious note, um, we have more or less a unified culture, except in the nuances of the little, little things. Uh, it's called the black culture. Uh, it's called the black culture, which cuts across the, 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 the continent. And we want to enrich that culture. We want to, to make sure the black, black con the, the continent is not looked at as a dark continent. We want to come away from the toga of, an, of, of, of developing countries uh, to develop. Uh, it's, it's more or less fighting for some kind of independence. That is, so we're, we're all independent, we're all, all the shackle of uh, colonial masters, but there's still that subtle, uh, that subtle thing wherein um, the more advanced countries might think they, they uh, might want to lord things over you because of 
your economic uh, weaknesses. And um, it's time for the continent to rise from that as one giant uh, continent and to come together as men. We can do that. We cannot do it in isolation. We cannot do it. Uh, uh, Ghana cannot do it by itself. I, Nigeria cannot do it by itself. Or well, maybe we can. Well, you, you, you get more, you gain more, you achieve more when you come together. In, in some cases, in a lot of cases, in a lot of issues, the Western world, they come together as one. They come together as one, especially when their interest is affected. So when, when the African interest is affected, we need to come together as one. Well. And we, we felt as legislators, and you know, I, when I came up in Nigeria in the Ninth Assembly with this issue of uh, parliamentary diplomacy. We felt as legislators that the world has changed. So, you know, we needed to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, yes, the executive have their work to do. But we pushed the envelope, we got involved, and we knew where to draw the line. Um, and we have been able to, we have been able to, 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 to score, uh, to make some great giant strides in terms of relationships between Nigeria, when Nigerians are affected. We did it in Ghana, we did it in South Africa. Um, we pushed the envelope and went to Ukraine to get our people back. Now, that is not your typical traditional legislative work. Uh, but when all arms come together, you have more or less a symbiotic relationship um, where the legislator helps the executive, the executive helps the legislature, and, and so on and so forth. That's what, um, it's one government, and that's what we have tried to do. The visual parliamentary diplomacy, I've tried to even imbibe that on our colleagues in other African countries. Very, 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 very keen on it. It gets results. Don't forget that when we did our debt, um, uh, when we had a uh, debt relief years ago, you know, Basolio, it was the legislature that actually muted the idea and actually went with the um, the Ngozi Wailers of that time um, to negotiate. The legislature was absolutely hundred percent involved. Uh, we have just in ninth assembly. Brought it out more. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, the, the last question was about how you are going to how you look at your final your final year uh, of this uh, stewardship. Um, we have our work cut out for us. There's still a lot to be done. We have a legislative agenda, uh, more or less a tempered agenda, which we reviewed after COVID. Uh, we're ticking the boxes as we go along. Uh, what have we done? In, uh, the, the, uh, if you remember, we, we termed our legislative agenda contract with Nigerians. And we, we've given everybody the case missing uh, synopsis of the legislative agenda. And we want to, at the end of, the, of our term, be able to tick off as many of those things, uh, put them in the done um, uh, basket, not the to do basket. Uh, and we've done well so far. Uh, the electoral act. The PIA, the um, onshore offshore dichotomy, the, uh, the return to the January December cycle, which has escaped us for years, PIA, which has escaped us for 30 years, and so on and so forth. This house is, uh, has recorded over 2,000 bills. I've not always believed in the quantity of bills, I've always believed in the quality of bills. But here we have a house that has, uh, last three years, processed over 2,000 bills, both in terms of, uh, and did well, both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality. Uh, uh, so there's, but, but hey, we, we, we're not there yet. We have another year, and I um, think that um, uh, there will be uh, many more uh, milestones uh, before we, we uh, many more, uh, yeah, uh, milestones before we, we, we end our tenure. I am hoping that uh, the constitutional review that we're embarking on will uh, go further and then it. Uh, that it did in years past. And I'm hoping more than anything else that um, we're able to empower our women um, beyond what we've already done. Thank you very much, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, and I say again, happy 60th birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, amplify it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>